let's hello to anyone who is joining us after the fact. We are so glad to know that you are. And here we go. Let us begin with prayer. God of faithful surprises, throughout the ages you have made known your love and power in unexpected ways and places. May we daily perceive the joy and wonder of your abiding presence and offer our lives in gratitude for our redemption. Amen. 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 Louise, I forgot to ask how Fred's doing. Is he off in the tube today? Yeah. yeah. Bless his heart. We say a special. How much prayer. longer will that go on? It's this week and I think Monday and then he has procedures. It's very complicated. It seems like every time he thinks he's going to be done, it ex gets extended, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we miss him. And Fred, if you're watching this after the fact, know that we miss you and that we're holding you in prayer. All right. So just a reminder of where we are in our wandering through the prehistory in uh, Genesis. Last week, we uh, began the flood story. Actually, I guess we began it two weeks ago. Um, and we will wrap that up today. And then you'll notice um, that Genesis 10 is another series of genealogies. So I am going to recommend that, as exciting as that is to discuss, that we all skim that on our own at some point this week. And I leave it to you. I'm not going to take, there's no quiz. Um, but then we pick up at this 11 next week, um, just because that will make for a much more interesting conversation. And then you all can decide if you want to continue on in Genesis into the patriarchal narratives of beginning with Abraham. Personally, I think that would be good after we've done the prehistory. But if you all decide you want to do something else, you can let me know. Um, but we're making some good time with Genesis. It's a faster read than some of the New Testament texts we've read. So that's all good because Genesis is long and we could be at this for a long time. <laughs> all right. So again, with some visuals, I keep showing this pastoral scene from Bruegel, the elder, about creation, the animals entering into Noah's Ark. And of course, it is meant to harken back to the creation narratives, the beginning of Genesis, Eden, you know, the the balance, the beauty, the serenity. Um, and then we read last week this quote, and I'll just read it one more time quickly from the Yale Bible study, because I really want to emphasize this rupture that happens at the point that we are reading in the text. Across both Mesopotamian and Israelite cultures and in all versions, there is one consistent element of the flood story. It marks the transition from the age before to the age of the present. In the biblical accounts in particular, this transition is indicated by God's changed attitude toward humanity, the acceptance of what humanity is and how we behave. If there is a fall in Genesis, it's more here than in the garden, for it's here that divine expectations are lowered. That just makes me so sad to accommodate our inherent nature. The imperfect. Be grateful. Uh, yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah. That is true, right? But it's just so sad that God has to lower expectations for us. Uh, the imperfections that we see around us and recognize in ourselves are officially and permanently encoded yikes at the end of the flood not only is there no going back to the garden there's no expectation on god's part that we ever should so there's like this this chasm this broad chasm has been created between you know that edenic world pre-flood and what happens afterwards now today we will read about the rainbow a very famous part of this story. 
Um, however, we also will read this passage at the beginning of chapter nine. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth. And this piece I just found very sobering, uh, especially as we wrap up No Mo May and we think about all the pollinators we have invited to our grounds here at St. Dunstan's. Um, and you know this piece called Human Disaster, Bee and Genesis, just got my attention. And so there's something about the relationship between humankind and the rest of creation <clears throat> shifts in this narrative um and you know we know that to be true of our own uh, experience of the environment and ecology and creation now so i just shared this image because I, it just was so sobering to me um and let me see i think that's all i wanted to say at this point point yes okay so um what i propose to do is read a chunk in the nrsv and then i will project the altar because we really do miss something if we don't see altars notes and uh, they are they're really good for this section so would somebody like to read uh, chapter nine, one through seven. Okay. Thanks, Donna. <clears throat> God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you shall rest on every animal of the earth and on every bird of the air on, on everything that cre creeps on the ground <laughs> and on all the fish of the sea and into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And just as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. For your own lifeblood, I will surely require a reckoning. From every animal, I re will require it. And from human beings each one for the blood of another. I will require a reckoning for human life. Whoever sheds the blood of a human, by a human shall that person's blood be shed. For in his own image, God made, made humans. And you be fruitful and multiply, abound on the earth and have dominion over it. Thank you, Donna. What do you notice? What strikes you here? So it's the prohibition against murder. Mm -hmm. the, and this is well, the first. Oh, go ahead. Some... I'm just going to wise, wisecrack that we are absolved of the need to eat black pudding. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, good thing. Yeah. And it also gives a little twist on Genesis where we were given plants. Now we can have plants and animals. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does is this the source of some of the um Jewish proscriptions on eating? Uh, like the way they interpret the blood and such. Yeah, I believe. I know, uh, what's that, Ellie? Yeah. That doesn't. I mean, that's this is this is the the line that um, creates. Uh oh! Did you? That's what, kosher salt, that's what kosher salt is all about. It's getting mm -hmm. the blood out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do the Muslims do it as well with halal, or is that? I believe yeah. that's yes. Yes, that's my understanding of halal. Ellie, can you hear us? You're frozen. It's a lovely picture of you, but we'd rather hear your voice and see you move. All right. Well, let's hope that you can thaw. Um, okay. So, yes. So, we have this idea of not consuming the blood. Um, 
what else strikes you all? Okay, she's going to try again, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's also at the very end is just saying, be fruitful and multiply. Mm -hmm. So there's that repetition of the command at creation, right? Um, let's just see what this footnote says. Multiply. It could either be uh, abound on the earth and have dominion over it or multiply in it. Um, and you know, that's an interesting interpretive question, isn't it? Because do we have dominion over creation? Should we have dominion over creation? Or are we just told to multiply in it? So again, that's a question of how we read the Hebrew. Um, let me pull up the altar. Um, let's see. And God blessed Noah and his sons. And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the dread and fear of you shall be upon all the beasts of the field and all of the fowl of the heavens in all that crawls on the ground and in all the fish of the sea. In your hand, they are given. All stirring things that are alive, yours shall be for food, like the green plants. I have given all to you. But flesh with its lifeblood still in it, you shall not eat. And just so your lifeblood I will requite. From every beast I will requite it. And from humankind, from every man's brother, I will requite human life. He who sheds human blood by humans, his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made humankind. As for you, be fruitful and multiply. Swarm through the earth. That's a great image of humans swarming through the earth and hold sway over it. Um, so let's just take a look at Alter's notes here because I do think they're kind of interesting. Um, he says, God's first post-diluvian in other words, after the flood speech to Noah affirms man's solidarity with the rest of the animal kingdom. The covenant he goes on to spell out is emphatically with all flesh, not just with humankind, but also modifies the arrangement stipulated in the creation story. Vegetarian man of the garden is now allowed a carnivore's diet. Uh, this might conceivably be intended as an outlet for his violent impulses. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Again, God's lowering God's standards. Like, okay, you got to get this out of you somehow. Um, and in consonance with that change, man does not merely rule over the animal kingdom, but inspires it with fear. Yikes. Um, and then this I thought was really interesting. This line here, he who sheds human blood by humans, his blood shall be shed. Um, so it, it says here, a system of retributive justice is suggested, you know, the eye for an eye. Um, as many analysts of the Hebrew have noted, there's an emphatic play on dam. The dam is part, is the word for blood and Adam, the, the word for human has dam in it. Um, and the chiastic word order, in other words, the, the crossing over um, of the Hebrew formally mirrors the idea of measure for measure. Spills blood of the human, by the human, his blood will be spilled. So that that's all meant to emphasize the connectedness between the blood and the human and the consequence of spilling blood. Um, so again, the last line I think is kind of damning, perhaps, pardon the pun, perhaps the ban on bloodshed at this point suggests that murder was the endemic vice of the antediluvians um, before the flood. And if you think about Cain and Abel, that happens really early on in this narrative. So it makes us wonder about our relationship with violence. Any also brings to mind feuding. Mm. Uh, not necessarily judicial shedding of blood, but uh, re re uh, 
vengeance, tribal vengeance or family vengeance. Mm -hmm. vengeance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And you, you said that about tribal. Um, yeah, and there's something really we might think of as primitive about that behavior. And yet, P.S., in 2024, we still see it. Um, yeah. What else strikes you? Are there any Hebrew words you want to look up? You want to push on? What's your pleasure? Well, this uh, Adam, mm -hmm. it's spelled like Adam. Yeah, that's what, yes. Ha Adam, Adam means humankind. So throughout Genesis, the early part of Genesis, the reference to Adam really is human. Um, so Adam is less of a name than a noun uh, describing who he is. Here she comes. Maybe I missed that before her. I haven't been doing Bible study as long as everybody. I'm just glad you brought it up. <laughs> this is this is how we reinforce these ideas. Hey, Ellie, can you hear us? I hope. I never knew that, Patty. Well, yay. I'm glad. So let's, yeah, let's take a look at, there oh, she yeah. is. I'm sorry. Did we see, seem to have lost the Wi-Fi here? That's okay. Uh -huh. That's okay. Um, let's see. Let's find the word Adam. And of course, it's. You probably mentioned it, and it, I just kind of. That's just okay. went over my head. That's it's why. Fun to hear, but it, it. If it isn't important at the moment, I wouldn't remember it. Exactly. Well, and it's interesting, too, that the word Dom is in Adam. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Which I, I did not realize until I read Alter's notes. So, Ellie, just to bring you back up to speed, um, we were looking at the Alter translation. Come on. Ah, okay. And his notes, his notes are so good. and. As always, you know, some of these Hebrew nuances get lost on us if we, you know, if we're not native speakers or readers, which I certainly am not. Um, and we're talking about the connection between the word for blood in Hebrew, dam, and the word for human, ha-adam, um, which is where we get Adam's name, as Louise was just saying. And so blood is part of the word for human and so it's just that's really interesting i think so and then the um hebrew shofek dam ha adam bach adam damo yishavek um whoever spills blood of the human by the human his blood will build oh she's gone again shoot uh, oh. i know so um, love that connection. And so there is the Hebrew word Adam, which means man or mankind, human being, but also Adam, first man. So excellent. Oh, poor Ellie, I want her here. Is there anything similar to that with the Eve? That's a good question. And I can't, let's see, let's go back and look, oh, sorry. We could do that later, Patty. Right now, because the question, when the question comes up, it's the time to do it because then it makes more sense to us. Um, okay, let's see. Um, okay, hang on one second. Let's see. I'm going to wait for Adam to name her. Um, maybe it, maybe he names her. Right in, there. Wait, where's that? Which verse? I can by quickly. Sorry. I'll slow down. Let's see. 
the mist, place the man. There's the river. Quite a creation woman as we have in that. Let's see. You want what Eve's creation is 21. 21. Thank you. Ah. He took, here she comes. Okay. Uh, let's see. Passion the woman. Just checking to see. Just want to see where her name comes out. She will mm -hmm. be woman. Yeah, still Haisha. Um, all right, give me one second. Kelly, I'm glad you're back. I'm sorry, this is so disruptive. Um, if this the Wi-Fi seems to be very weak here. Um it is if not it happens all disrupt disruptive. Um, I'm, we're just trying to find out um, where Eve's name is first brought up in early Genesis. Uh, I should know this. Verse, verse 23 has that she shall be called woman. Let's mm -hmm. see. But where yeah, is, is Eve? Eve? Mm -hmm. Eve? Oh, Eve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just. Because Louise has a great question about what Eve means in Hebrew. And the easiest way for me to find it is if we can find it in the English. And I should know this, and I don't. So I'm now curious about it. This is how I learn from you all. Let's see. Well, let me get my, uh, let me get my phone, and we'll do it this way. Chapter yeah. 4 says... Oh. The human knew Eve, his ah, woman. Okay, thank you. All right. All right, let's see. There we go. All right, thank you. Oh. AI, AI has a gloss on it. Okay, what does AI say? Uh, it comes from the name Hala, which means life or living one. Some mm -hmm. key points about the history and name of Eve derived from Hebrew roots, meaning to breathe and to live or life giver. That's interesting, meaning, life giver, when you think about a woman. Meaning, meaning, uh, uh, traditional meanings include uh, life and full of life and mother of life. There you go. Thank you. So I guess it's not as much of a pun or a play on words as Adam is. Um, but that is good to know. Um, chava, um, life or living, first woman, wife of Adam. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm glad you asked the question, Louise. Thank never, you. never, ever uh, hesitate to ask when you've got a question, anybody, because this is how we all learn. Um, no. Okay, so. Um, yes, ma'am. I have a question, or maybe an observation. I mean, it seems that that Adam and Eve, as they were originally created, were just to be there as a couple. I mean, first Adam, and then realized there was some deficiency in companionship or whatever. And then he got Eve. And then, I mean, they were supposed to just be happy <laughs> and eat fruit. <laughs> And um, then uh, Satan kind of changed everything. They got kicked out. And then they were told to be fruitful and multiply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it, it seems like, a, I guess it explains the human condition that and it seems as, uh, as though when we read Old Testament literature in the past, uh, they there's a great emphasis on the dispersing of the human seed and of a man having his generations follow him. That's so important. And I wonder, is this kind of a natural thing that uh, you'd want to kind of fill up this land, this empty land, or is this particularly uh, Hebrew? Question. We've lost John. Um, what do you all think? 
I think uh, uh, Donna's right that there is a distinct um, division between, I'm, I'm just, uh, the end of chapter three, where everybody's driven out of the garden, mm -hmm. and chapter four, bang, all of a sudden there's sex, there's procreation, and at the same time, there's pro procreation with pain for the women, um, mm -hmm. which was part of the the, the curse back um, back back in the uh, oh, there's the first time Eve shows up is in uh, uh, three twenty, yes. um, but anyway. Um, I get I get the mental image of God creating this giant model train set, and there's yeah. there's you know two little bipeds that are walking around, and they've got the trees and all this sort of thing, and then something's got to change, mm. and they suddenly develop free will, and the whole you know thing falls off the table and got to you know <laughs> start over. <laughs> I have a similar, I guess we've all thought about this over the decades of our our, our own lives, but it, I, I kind of have a, a mental image of the before the fall in the garden of creatures very much living the way chimpanzees live, mm. uh, living naturally, uh, without conscience, without consciousness particularly, except what they need to survive. And then there's that line in the fruit story, in the tree, uh, the apple tree, of eating, the, having the knowledge of good and evil. And once that enters, that's human consciousness that, mm -hmm. that animals do not have. Occasionally, the dog looks like she's ashamed. But so <laughs> when she doesn't make eye contact, yes. Yeah, uh, but, but it, it seems to me true. that the the then all of the stuff the uh, murder the theft the procreation and everything else becomes questionable. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It's and all I back oh, sorry. Perfect. Pardon me, Ellie. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh, because at that at that point, that's where creation becomes imperfect. Hmm. Hmm. With yeah, because it, before that, it, it was it, it it was what it was. Mm -hmm. There was there was not a judgment about its perfection or lack of perfection. It just was what it was. There's a volcano. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Oh, huh. I see what you mean. Yeah, there was there was no knowledge of good and evil. There was just mm -hmm. there. It is what yeah. it is. Exception of whatever is out there. Elin, what were you going to say? Um. Eddie just referenced um, verse 20 in chapter 3 as giving um, Adam giving his wife's name Eve. And my cross-reference says the name in Hebrew resembles the word for living. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whether that's relevant or not, I'm not sure. But um, <coughs> I'm sure, sure Paul that. just got something to say about that, too. Mm. Akaba mm -hmm. is, is a very common woman's name in in the Jewish culture, yes. I mean, that's one of Tevye's three daughters, five daughters, however oh, many. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's true. I hadn't thought about that. I think actually Chuck oh, had yeah. a student named Kaba. She was very, she was brilliant. So, yeah. Um, Beautiful name, Life Bearer. I mean, I, I wouldn't mind that name. Uh, Donna, what were you going to say, my dear? Well, in the, um, the book, the reading Genesis book, um, the distinction is made that that the Hebrew God, the um, one God, <clears throat> was also a loving God. Mm. And that that was the distinction because all of the other gods, multiple gods, they weren't loving. They mm. could be really nasty. And um, that so I was thinking, well, to carry it farther, when you get, because I was kind of worried, like my thought was, well, why did God make free will if it was going to mess everything up? But I think one possible answer is that if a man has free will, you can love God or not. Mm -hmm. So it was the only way that God knew whether the love would mm -hmm. come back to him. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Right. 
So my question for us to think about, and, and it's connected to both what Donna was just saying and what Ray said before, and, and Ellie too, about you know consciousness and the knowledge of good and evil. Would you rather be in that state without free will um, or is free will a gift that is valuable? What, you know, what do you think about that? Oh, Patty, you're such a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> you make you make us to think. <laughs> well, this well, is a question I ask yeah. myself a lot. So that's why I wonder what you all think. Well, I, I, <clears throat> yes, let's let's wrestle with that. It, uh, I begin by asking what are we talking about as free will? Hmm. If we're talking about it in the context of knowledge of good and evil, uh, it, it comes out of making choices with knowledge. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how free that is, uh, uh, whether it is unbounded from God's point of view or not. I don't know that. We know that we, know that we are punished by our sins. Hmm. <laughs> But uh, maybe the ability to think about consequences comes with that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just, I, I'm answering your question with a series of questions. Well, I think that's really kind of what we have to do, I think. Other, does anyone else have any thoughts about that? Well, I think for me, like when I was young, I free will is very, very, appealing because you have your whole life ahead of you <laughs> and, and as you get older and when I think of gosh maybe I'm going to be a lot older hopefully maybe this free will is not what it's chalked up to be and it'd be nice, <laughs> and it'd be nice to be in the garden and be happy and not have aches and pains <laughs> I don't know if that's mm -hmm. so I think it kind of depends on where you are in your life well, Louise, you triggered something else for me, which is to say if the free will looks infinite when you're young, mm -hmm. it seems my experience is that the, the scope of the freeness of will narrows after you've made choices. It, it does narrow. And the other, the other thing is if you're in really, even if you're young, in a really desperate situation, I think about uh, people whose troubles are way more than mine and who didn't have the advantages I had. I had tons of advantages with growing up with the family that I had. I, I can see that the idea of free will is not that appealing because you don't really have any choices. You're, you're, you're so um, overwhelmed by your circumstances. Like the women All in Afghanistan, they don't even have, they don't have any free will. No, they do not. I'm just I think like, uh, oh, go ahead. a lot of a lot of people, even in this country, think that they have free will, but they are so bounded by circumstances that they, you know, we would look at it as not. That if you are so poor mm -hmm. uh, or so uneducated, this and that, mm -hmm. other thing, you aren't aware of the choices that are out there to choose freely. You, those choices aren't available. I just want to read a verse from John's gospel. I had to look it up. Hang on one sec. Um, and it comes right at the end of the gospel. So those of us who read John together may remember this. Um, it is during its post resurrection and it is Jesus appearing. Hang on. Um, to the disciples and it's right after so jesus has his dialogue with peter and i'll just read this this is the risen christ talking with peter when they had finished breakfast jesus, this is when they had breakfast on the beach jesus said to simon peter simon son of john do you love me more than these peter said to him yes lord you know that i love you jesus said to him feed my lambs a second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. 
He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he'd said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, and this is what's relevant. When you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. And that reminded me exactly of what you were saying, Louise, about you know, when you're young, you can do whatever you want. But then as you get older, your choices narrow and maybe you want your choices to narrow because there's some comfort in someone else taking care of you. But it does seem, you know, Jesus talks about this. It seems like it's here as well. So hopefully that wasn't a red herring, but I, I just heard that so loudly as we were talking about this, that there's this progression. Um, any other thoughts about free will? Would you trade free will for that Edenic perfection? Some days I would. Honest. <laughs> yeah. I think just, just, I don't think this is digression. I think that in that young state that Louise pointed to, there are choices you can make that expand rather than contract. Mm -hmm. uh, education is the one that comes to mind for me. And you become aware, more and more aware of, of choices rather than of what's out there rather than uh, narrowing down funneling down to fewer and fewer until you make choices but it's uh, the opening the world travel does that mm -hmm. uh, elon sure knows about that right about how yeah. travel expands our horizons yeah although i said yes that some days i'd like to have it and i would it would be like going on a vacation, just lolling back and mm -hmm. having. No, 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 no. That's not the way to travel. <laughs> no, no. But this is the this is a, a vacation, not travel. But um, it vacation does... travel is a vacation. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but um, it makes you lesser if you give up your free will. You are lesser as a, as an entity, as a person, as a being. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, you're back toward the apes. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of what I was thinking too, when you were talking about that, Ray, your image of the chimpanzees and just kind of being there without thinking about consequence or consciousness. Um, and then my other question has to do, so is violence endemic to humankind? You know, this idea that God says, okay, you can eat meat because you need an outlet for your violent behavior. I thought that was such an interesting note that Alter gave us. Um, you know, is violence inherently part of the human condition? Is that who we are? And is that part of why God lowers God's standards and says, okay, that's who they are. Um, what do you all think? It's kind of hard to think it's not when you look around the world and see what's happening. Seriously, yeah. <laughs> totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think too, if we connect that, connect the dots to Jesus and his idea of turning the other cheek and you know during the trial when peter reaches out with his sword to slice off the soldier's ear and pete and jesus says no don't do that you know it's it's as though jesus is saying um it's not as though i think jesus is saying you know it's time to redeem that behavior it's time to get past that um and is that something we can do on our own? Or do we need God's grace to do that? These are big questions to which I do not have the answers. I don't have the answer key in my Bible. But these are the kinds of things that 
I think many of us think about, right? Especially as we get older and especially as we, um, you know, think about what does life really mean? Yeah. What's the point? I guess it's endemic, but it's not inevitable. Oh, can you, all right. Can you tease that out? That's yeah. Assumption. I mean, it, it, we see the violence. You can't deny the violence. And, and it, I mean, I, I know myself, I have a, you know, a, at the mere minimum, I will come, be brought to throwing things, mm -hmm. projectiles, which leads <laughs> you. <to, laughs> so, uh, it so I think it, it's it's innate in us, but it can be controlled, as many other drives uh, can be controlled. Uh, so I think it's it is not inevitable. It's just because it is in the wiring that it has to be expressed, and. And well, there's that, there's your there's your freedom of choice. Exactly. Yeah, you, you, I, yeah. Either you can either you can just stamp around in a circle, or you can and and not throw something, um, or, or or sublimate it in some other way, uh, and maybe in a good way. Apparently, you know, if, if you're madder in hell at uh, the Israelis or the, or the Hamas, you can feed the hungry people. Mm -hmm channel that same energy mm. yeah um and i it did, but it raised another question uh i was married for a long time to a presbyterian old calvinist type mm. uh not that wasn't the personality but that was that is installed in presbyterian kids at that time the way the virgin mary is installed in catholic kids things are predestined mm -hmm. it's it is mm -hmm. uh it is part of becomes part of their wearing. Throughout her life, she was convinced that it didn't matter what choices she made because it was all predestined. Wow. wow. And it was there's a certain element of uh, well, you can take that wherever you want to take it. I know where it went. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Experience that, but that is you know I it really is a red flag. For that pre predestination, that Calvinist uh, philosophy, for me, I think that it denies the what right here, what the choices can be made, and um, that we're given free will in order not to have predestination. Mm -hmm. I have often thought that I would, you know, what's the alternative to free will? It's sort of to be the the marionette with God pulling the strings yeah. and. You know what? Google. You know that's not very appealing to me. That said, left to my own devices, like Ellie would say, I love that image of the the model train set falling off the table. That's yes, <laughs> falling off the table more times than I care to admit. Um, and <laughs> I, here we go again. I, I you know I can't get out of my own way, and so you know that to me that's why I need jesus to be in relationship with him because he reveals to me how god might want me to live differently and so there's that choice um but the he idea identifies that is just not very appealing i'm sorry Ellen. go ahead just that um sort of combining everybody here um ray yes um violence is innate in the human being and therefore um it's a good thing we have free choice, um, freedom of choice, because then we can choose between, um, as I say, you know, uh, throwing things or going and feeding people. Um, and Jesus is there to to point out that if you make the right choice, that is in a divine direction. Um, and if you don't, then it's in the human um, direction. You're saying rise above humanity. Well, yeah, rise, rise above instincts. your natural human instinct instinct to kick a puppy. So, yeah. Which is our, you know, our psychologists might call that our, our lower selves, our lesser selves. Um, well, Freud had a field day. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Exactly. Well, these are questions um, that we should just keep revisiting. Go ahead, Elon. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, uh, on, to simplify what you just said, one of my children did something wicked. I can't even remember what it was. And they said, 
the devil made me do it. <laughs> that was the reasoning behind it. Yep. Uh, I think it was at the time they were going to a group um, on the Friday evening at the Baptist church. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Going over to those Baptists. Huh? Yeah. Mm. Or Calvinists. <laughs> yeah, or the Calvinists. Yeah, we didn't have, uh, yeah. So much for free choice. Exactly. Yeah, so much of free choice, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Would someone like to read this next paragraph about the rainbow? Sorry about that annoying arrow. Is that, try to move it. Is that eight there? I'll, yes. I'll try. Okay, let me give it a try. Thank you. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, as for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I will make between you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And when I bring the clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between you, and me and you, and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all the flesh that is on earth. Thank God you. God said to oh. okay. Well, oh no, go this. ahead. Sorry, I I I was just the rest of the paragraph. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on earth. That was repetition there. Thank you. Sorry, I preempted. Um, what do you hear? It's a familiar part of the story. God surrendered. <laughs> to the inevitable. Yeah. Um, my notes say um, that a covenant is an agreement between a superior and an inferior entity. And I think that's interesting. The former making mm. or establishing a bond with the latter and the superior protecting the weaker party. And I didn't know that was the meaning of covenant. Mm. What do you all think neither. Yeah, I don't often think about that power differential with a covenant. I always have thought about a covenant as more equitable. Um, so what do you think about the superior, inferior? That's really helpful, Donna. Hmm. Well, it kind of it kind of makes sense because it's it's what Donna said because it's not like we're giving something he's mm -hmm. just he's just giving to us yeah because when we get to Abram in Genesis twelve it's mm. much more two sided right and you know it's a, it's a quid pro quo God will do this Abram will do that. But here, as you say, Louise, it's, you know, there's nothing coming from Noah and his sons. It's, this is what God will do. It's almost like God's penitent heart. Um, you know, I, it it's almost sounds like God is regretful of what has happened. Um, it also sounds like insurance. This mm -hmm. is something you don't have to fear. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, on the other hand, our language talks about keeping the covenant mm -hmm. from the human side. So I, I don't see how that is possible in this language. Yeah, this is a slightly different kind of covenant, I would say. And I'm curious about um, 
the Hebrew here. And it's not just with people, it's with every living creature. Exactly, sure. exactly. Yes. And the, um, I'm not sure that the this Hebrew is particularly useful here, Barit. Um, but culturally, the expression was to cut a covenant because uh, a covenant would literally be cut in stone and then sealed by um, the sacrifice of an animal. And so the animal blood. Now, you know, haven't gotten to that point here yet. Um, but this idea of this binding covenant, um, treaty, agreement. See, again, this is man to man. It's an ordinance. Mm hmm with signs or pledges. And so, of course, the sign here is that rainbow. Um, I will, sign. It's a beautiful sign. And I remember vividly um, in 2005, watching the footage of Katrina and sitting sobbing in front of the TV and just saying, God, you promised. God, you promised. Um, I had a long conversation with God about Katrina, um, but you know, there are so many natural disasters like that um, that are so, you know, that wipe out whole communities, whole people. Um, that's That was an issue for me. And not that I take this story literally, but I, it, you know, when it came right down to it, my heart was broken. And uh, I remember that so strongly. This is a slight digression, but as we were taught this story by the good sisters, it was it was it was this early Cold War time, mm. and they were quick to point out that well, maybe we won't get a flood again, but next time by fire. Apparently, mm. they linked that to the Fatima mm. appearances. Hmm. Uh, so it doesn't say there won't be another disaster, but I think that's unnecessarily negative. Yeah, yeah, hmm. yeah. The uh, rainbow, you see a rainbow at the end of a storm, and I've seen some some glorious ones, but maybe you can identify it as a reminder that, well, he could have, he could have mm -hmm. swept everybody off, but no, it was just these 100,000 people or whatever, but it wasn't everybody, it's not total destruction. That's a really interesting point. And as you were saying that, Ellie, it, it struck me probably for the first time that the rainbow is for the benefit of the beholder, right? And so you know, if I'm still here, to see said rainbow, then okay, I'm doing all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know, it is it's that reminder to say, okay, thank you, God. You know, God could have, God does have the capacity. God could be destructive, um, and yet here I am. Um, so and there is beauty. What's that? And there is still beauty. There's still beauty. Still well, if, if if you accept the premise of climate change, a lot of this we're bringing on to ourselves. Exactly. If you look at what's happening in Bangladesh and other parts of the world, you know, where pe people are just, you know, and then another home just fell into the ocean. Exactly. That recently that was in the newspaper. No, it's even, yeah. even, on the, even, go, even going back to Katrina, we have to ask what is the human part of this equation? Isn't the storm, but the, how does the damage occur? And if you have destroyed your coastal water defenses, the mangroves and all of that, uh, there's a human contribution that, that can be mitigated, can be prevented. Uh, you know, exactly, exactly. Well, and that's why this, this piece of art with the bees struck me. Uh, and that line, the fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth. Do we humans want to be dreaded by the rest of creation? Because we have our own destructive 
power, um, as you all were just saying. And you know, what's our complicity in that? Um, question, we have a little bit left in this chapter. Would you want to spend five or six minutes finishing up or do you want to pick up here next week? Whatever your pleasure is, is, up, is fine with me. I'd, I'd like to finish, but. Is that good with everybody? Okay. okay, let's finish the chapter. All right, so. Would somebody like to read 18 to 29? I can do that. I'll, I'll just read from my book. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Jepheth. Is that correct? Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was peopled. Noah was the first tiller of the soil. He planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it upon both their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son's son had done to him, he said, cursed be Canaan, a slave of slaves, shall he be to his brothers. He also said, blessed by the Lord my God be Shem and let Canaan be his slave. God enlarged Jepheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his slave. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years and he died. You. That doesn't yeah. seem the least fair. I agree. <laughs> I agree too. All right, let's talk about that. Why is it's that not like it's not like Noah had a do not disturb sign outside there. You, oh my God. Ew. Was he alone? <laughs> These are good questions. What does nakedness mean? Does mm -hmm. nakedness stand in for something else? I mean, it doesn't seem to me that he was by himself in his tent. And, I don't know. He just got drunk, drunk and forgot to cover up. I don't know. Why is that so horrible? So, okay. Good point. Implying shameful exposure. Now think back to Adam and Eve, right? What is the curse of eating from that fruit? Mm. Realize that they are naked. They're filled with shame. And so there's that, that you know, shame is weaseling its way into the story again. Um, I have such an issue with shame that I, oof. Um, shame causes such destruction. And so here it is again, you know, this idea of um, can't, uh, really being uncovered, being revealed, being exposed, you know, being as he was created. That makes sense. Um, and so there's this human um, prohibition against that against nakedness um so so we've got that you know and was noah wrong to um drink his wine and i love it when it said noah awoke from his wine I love it. <laughs> a little hungover maybe um so you know what's what's ham's crime here mm. Well, it all depends on what he said when he came out of the tent. Um, uh, I mean, I suppose if if he went out and mocked the, his father, but they don't. It doesn't say here what he did and what was this crime and what had the younger son done to him. All he did was see him. Maybe there there needs a little a little more explanation here. 
But the other thing is the punishment is visited on Ham's son. Son, yeah. Mm. It's not visited on the father. It's visited yeah. on the son, mm. which is to me particularly, I mean, if there, if it was somehow evil to go into somebody's tent without, you know, knocking or whatever, the equivalent of knocking, you know, you're punishing, the wrong, you're not punishing the right person. Yeah. Maybe the real hey. thing. Uh, maybe the real crime was seeing that he his father was imperfect hmm. and that he realized he was imperfect. And the other two brothers, Shem and Japheth, they turned their back. Right. They, they really, I mean, think how foolish they would have looked backing up, going backwards and throwing the robe behind them. They went out of their way not to see any imperfection in their father. And I guess that's maybe that's what the father couldn't stand. Why he yeah, visited it on the grandson, I don't know. It just seems so it just seems so unfair to give the son of one as the to the slave of the other two brothers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Canaan didn't do anything in this Nothing. situation. I'm okay, Shem and Japheth, okay, that 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 was a good that was a good deed to to respect their father's modesty and you know throw a towel over him um but you're, you're absolutely right louise um canaan didn't do anything he was completely uninvolved mm -hmm. although maybe it would be a punishment to ham to have his son mm -hmm. thrown to be a slave mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a pat you know a patriarchal society that very much could be the case. I wonder too if Ham's real crime here is telling his brothers. It's one thing for him to accidentally see his father and go, oops, sorry, dad. Um, but then going out, you know, does he go out and he says, guess what, guys? You know, so, you know, I wonder if that isn't part of it. Um, yeah, Ray. So I've got the, uh, oh, excuse me. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Ray. I've got the altar's notes here. I'm going to pull those up for us while you... And read. I'm quite a ways into the notes, but I'll just read a section. Some, as early as the classical Midrash, have glimpsed here a Zeus Kronos story in which the son castrates the father or alternatively penetrates him sexually. This latter possibility is re reinforced by the fact that, open quote, to see the nakedness of, close quote, frequently means to copulate with. And it's noteworthy that the Hebrews associated the Canaanites with lasciviousness, et cetera, and so on. Mm -hmm. oh. So you think about fasting, fast forwarding in <clears throat> scripture. What is the land of Canaan? Palestine. Mm -hmm. What's that, Ray? It said Palestine. Ah, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's the promised land, the land promised to Abraham and his descendants and even Moses leading the people of Israel to the promised land. The problem is when you know Abram gets or Abraham gets to Canaan, there are already people there. And Abraham has been told that this is the land, you know, this is the land God has promised him. And so there's something here about why, you know, it, is it manifest destiny? Is it the doctrine of discovery? It's like somehow the Israelites who are the descendants of Shem or Japheth, um, they have some sort of inherent right to the land of Canaan. Here we are in 2024. Need I finish that thought? Um, so, you know, you see this, this narrative is setting up this superiority of one line over the other. And there's, you know, and it all goes back to this shameful thing that Ham did, you know, mythologically, this is the justification. Well, if Ham hadn't done that, you know, Talk about the sins of the father are visited on the son, as you said, Louise, that, you know, it all goes back, um, you know, and it's sort of inevitable because this is the 
the lineage of Ham, um, the Canaanites who are meant to be conquered by the descendants of Ham's brother. So we can trace a lot that goes on even today, at least the just, you know, the attempted justification for it back to this narrative. Can I step ahead to Deuteronomy? Please. Just just this much, because the entering the land of Canaan that's doing it. Uh, in the discussion of current events this week, somebody uh, went back to early Deuteronomy, and I've, I've got the citation if anybody wants it, but talk about not only filling the land, but completely annihilating the inhabitants. Mm -hmm. Man, woman, and child leave none of them living. And, uh, and then echoing that, we have uh, some government officials, not Netanyahu, but within that government, referring to the Palestinians as uh, where whoever the group was in the Bible were to be annihilated. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, just, I, yep. I, I said it because I couldn't not say it. Exactly, Sorry. and that's exactly this. That's exactly it, it's totally connected. Um, yes. And so we see the power of these, you know, one of the questions I've been asking as we've been reading these early chapters of Genesis has been, you know, okay, understanding that these are mythological origin stories, right? How do they shape our understanding now of God? And that's a perfect example. Even now, there is this sense that uh, the descendants of Israel are somehow um, destined to conquer, subdue, annihilate, annihilate, wipe out um, the Canaanites or you know, the people of this other land, this promised land. And so this is you know, just a very simplistic um, foundational story for really complicated current geopolitical events. So um, yeah. Thank you for saying that, Ray. All right. Thank you for hanging in there and finishing up this chapter together. Sorry, let me pull this out. Um, I want to first, again, just remind us, and I'll remind you this week, if you want to, I encourage you to skim over chapter 10. It you know, connects the dots between the sons of Noah and the Tower of Babel, which we'll read next week. And that will wrap up the prehistory section of Genesis. Um, and then the last thing I was thinking when we were talking, when Louise was talking about climate change and when I was talking about the bees and all of that. And Ray was talking about our complicity. Complicity. I thought that I would offer this opportunity um, to say these words of confession. If you would like to respond with those words that are printed in bold italics, please do. Otherwise, I'll, I'll just read it straight through um, on behalf of all of us. Let us pray. We confess that we have considered the earth to be our own. Believing God gave us dominion and thus absolute control over it. We affirm, we affirm that the earth, the earth is, the is the Lord's and all that all is, it. It is in it. For he, he has founded it on the seas, seas and established it on the rivers. We repent. We know we need to change our understanding of creation taking our share of responsibility for its care and protection. We believe that the spirit, the spirit God creating, creating power is active in us and in all the, in the world. God creator of all, may humankind be freed from greed, which is destroying the earth. And may your courageous churches take up causes against the forces that threaten life. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm.
Thank, Thank you everybody. all for a really wonderful session. And we Thank will you. pick up with the Tower of Babel next week. Sounds great. All right. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Thank Thanks so much.